Hey everyone, what is going on and welcome back to another video from a man talks NRL super coach and in today's video We're going to be going through the round two teamless Tuesday. Let's get in So before we get into teamless just wanted to give a quick shout out to perpetual motion who topped out our overall group league uh, To begin the round he had a massive 1436 points to begin the season uh, and he's already ranked in the top 100 which is an absolutely amazing effort So big props to him uh, if you guys aren't in that group league uh, there's a code in the description below but let's get into the rest of the team lists. So round two kicks off uh, with the Eels and the Storm uh, playing on Thursday night at Bankwest Stadium. Uh, the only change with the Eels outfit is that uh, Keegan Hipgrave has been moved out of the 17 and into the reserves uh, with the return of Murata near Corey um, from his suspension. Um, and he moves onto the bench now. But in terms of the starting lineup for the Eels, it's the exact same as what was played last round. Uh, and I wouldn't expect any more surprises in, ter in terms of, say, like the minutes. The only question I had from last week was maybe Nathan Brown was only playing about, I think, 55-ish minutes. And I thought he'd be playing more close to that 70 kind of minute, uh, minute range. So that is something to keep an eye on. I think it was, a lot of that was due to Isaiah Papali'i and his performance. So he may potentially be a good one to keep an eye on. But otherwise, overall with the Eels, very settled outfit. Uh, and in terms of the makeup of the Eels bench, it's the same as last week where they had three forwards and that one kind of utility role in Will Smith. So again, I don't really expect too many changes, maybe potentially in the minutes. Uh, we'll just have to come, one of those things we'll have to keep an eye on. It's not enough to just go off round one. Uh, for the Storm, they're basically 1-17, to 17, no kind of new con injury concerns. Obviously, they're still missing guys like Harry Grant and Dale Finucane. But in terms of their bench, exact same as what it was come game day. Obviously, Tyson Smoothie was named out on the reserves before on, on Teamless Tuesday, but he moved into that uh, bench role uh, prior to kickoff. Uh, and he's retained that spot, which does suggest that, you know, Brandon Smith is going to get spelled at some point playing at hooker, but I can still expect him to be playing around that 60 to 65 minute mark. He's obviously one that I think a lot of people are going to have some question marks over, given that he only produced about, what, 43 points, I think, last round. Um, and I think a lot of people were hoping for a lot more than him in the absence of Harry Grant. So I don't know if it's necessarily like a sell for Brandon Smith this week. Even with Tyson Smooth on the bench, I'd still expect some good minutes from him. Uh, and I think, you know, I would maybe hold him at least for this round to kind of see what the minutes make up is going to be um, and you know from there you can maybe potentially then pivot on to other second row forwards uh, before the price uh, price changes kick in in round three similar kind of narrative I think with Christian Rolch you know him getting that 52 points I think is not a massive concern and to be honest I think him getting around that 50 to 60 mark is probably what I would expect uh, throughout the season. So I don't think he really deviated too much from what his potential is. So I don't think he's like an immediate concern or anything. I think I would just continue to hold as well. In terms of the game itself, I'm hoping for a really good game. It's at Bank West, which should hopefully give the Eels some more confidence. Uh, like I own Dylan Brown as well. Um, and I'm not quite sure yet what I'm going to do this round with him, whether I want to hold or potentially move and flip him to my flip him to like a Jaden Braley via Connor Watson, who's currently in my hook position. Something I've been thinking about. I think Dylan Brown still was going to be a good player and you know last week he only came around with 39 points but it was basically all in base so he really does have a high floor the only negative is that he is versing the storm so I don't know how well he's going to go and whether I whether I actually want to hold him because I expect if he get, again scores relatively low say the 40 50 mark his price is going to go down a lot come round three so I might I may potentially just do that, that trade early but yeah otherwise not too many changes to talk about uh, with the eels in the storm so the next game is the warriors versus the knights I think the warriors had a really good showing against the titans look like they were really solid in defense uh, and there's not too many changes with them obviously the most notable out is uh, Ewan Aiken who's now picked up I think like an ankle injury uh, and he's going to be out for eight to ten weeks so Adam Pompey replaces him at center. In terms of the rest of the side, you know, I think uh, Adam Fennell Blake looked really good in that first game, getting about, what, 65 points in his 58 minutes, which is, I think, a really good showing from him. Tohu Harris, again, obviously just, I think he got 65 or 66, uh, which I suggested that's basically what you can always expect from him. He's super, super consistent. Uh, Nick Arima had a really good game as well with the goal kicking, plus the uh, getting that try as well. Not quite sure yet what the situation is on terms in terms of the goal kicking. Uh, from what I've from what I've gathered, I think uh, Nick Arima is still going to hold the goal kicking for at least maybe this round and maybe a few, a couple more weeks. We're just not quite sure yet. Uh, that was the main reason I actually deviated away from Harris Tavita and went with Jamal Fog Fogarty instead because uh, I thought that little ad uh, added goal kicking bonus is really what attracted me to Harris Tavita as well. Again, one of those things to keep an eye on in, in the news and see if that. Um, gets confirmed in any way but aside from that warrior is very settled apart from that you and aiken injury uh the bench makeup is the same as what it was last year uh last brown sorry <laughs> uh with that four forward bench so yeah i don't expect too many kind of you know surprises coming out of that warriors game in terms of say the minutes uh with the knights very settled uh obviously they had some uh concerns coming into this uh game 
uh, with Kurt Mann and uh, Braden Best um, having some injury problems, but they seem to have gotten over that and are ready to go for this round as well. Um, they're named 1-17. to 17. Uh, Obviously, we did see prior to the game that Connor Watson was swapped out to the number 14 role uh, with uh, Suasa Sui uh, coming in at number 13. Honestly, I wouldn't be too surprised if that happens again, given that I don't think Connor Watson's role was quite done what he was maybe intended to, given that Kurt Mann had that injury and he had to come in and fill that at 5'8". So if, say, Kurt Mann plays the full game at number 6, we can then see Connor Watson and his role and how he's used. Either way, I don't think there's any too many concerns with him, given that he scored fairly well for his price, and I expect him to still make a good impact off the bench if that does happen again. Um, the story of last week for the Knights, I think, was all about the forwards, you know, with Clemmer, Saifidi, and Barnett all going huge. Barnett, I think, is going to be a really, really popular trade-in for this week, and I'm not surprised. Uh, he was very low-owned to begin the season. Um, to be honest, probably someone I unfortunately overlooked you know, to my, I knew that he had good credentials, but for some reason, I just didn't really think about him long enough to consider him. With that goal kicking, he really does become an appealing option. Uh, and, you know, obviously the talk is that, you know, when Ponga comes back, Ponga will take up the goal kicking and Barnett's going to lose it. But, you know, for the next over, over the next few weeks, if Barnett seems to be kicking them pretty at a pretty good clip, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, because Ponga sometimes does have his problems with the goal kicking. You know, Barnett potentially might just hold that goal kicking duties. We're not quite sure. And if he does, then he becomes you know a good long season hold you know not just like a short-term punt to maximize the time that he is goal kicking so I think he's definitely going to be a player that a lot of people are going to be bringing in um I don't know quite now I don't quite know how I myself might get my, myself to him this round but someone I'm definitely keeping an eye on and looking at my uh, my squad seeing how I can maybe tinker with it to potentially get him in in the next couple of weeks yeah aside from that pretty interested in this game you know obviously the Knights had a good display last week against the Dogs um and the Warriors did as well against the Titans so I think this is going to be a pretty even game I can't it's quite hard to call this but in terms of the team news not too many uh, not too much to report on. So next up, we've got the Titans and the Broncos. I'm really looking forward to this Friday night match, you know, the Queensland derby between the two. Uh, in terms of the Titans lineup, the only real notable absentee is Brian Kelly, who unfortunately has fractured his hand, and I think he's due to come back around ri- round five. So really unfortunate for Kelly owners. You know, I was very high on him to begin the season, and I really recommended him. He didn't have his a great game last week, but he only scored 47 without any real attacking upside, which really shows that he has got good base um, and a pretty decent floor. So Philip Sammy is going to be replacing him for the next few weeks. Apart from that, the rest of the Titan side is very settled. And if anyone had question marks over guys like, say, Fogarty, who like I have in my team, for example, I'm not too concerned with, uh, with him, to be honest, given that he did only score 40 last week. But it was 40 where, you know, the Titans only scored six points and he really had no involvement at all in attacking upside. So if that's his game where he gets, if that's a game where he doesn't get any attacking points and he gets 40, I'm pretty happy with that. It shows that, you know, if he is able to nab a try or if he get, gets a couple of try assists, you know, he's able to go into that 60 to 70 point range. So I think I wouldn't be too concerned if you have him or say like Ash Taylor. I think they're still good holds. Um, I think they just came up against the Warriors side who looked really solid in defense. Um, and, you know, the Titans attack isn't quite fully gelled yet. You know, given that they've got so many new big players who they have trying to fit in uh, and still work on those combinations. Make up at the bench, exact same as last week. So I don't think there should be any surprises in terms of how the minutes are spread across the forwards. Uh, Broncos, a couple of things to report on them. Obviously, the biggest one is Matt Lodge, who's out for the next kind of two to four weeks, I think, uh, given that hamstring issue he's picked up. Really unfortunate, given that a lot of people would have had Matt Lodge from round one, given that potential for him to play big minutes and get good points while Payne Haas was out. But unfortunately, with this injury, he's basically going to be out for that time when Haas is out. By the time he's back, Payne Haas is going to be back too. And that kind of advantage of his bigger minutes and bigger responsibility in the forwards is negated. So I wouldn't say he's necessarily like a straight sell. Obviously, if you haven't got any kind of good front row forward cover, say, for example, he was in one of your starting two front rows, could potentially, you know, run with someone like Spencer Linu as your second starting front row forward. But... You know, that's a bit of a risk given that obviously Linu had a good display last week, but we just don't quite know if that's minutes is going to be maybe the same or his output would be the same. If you have if you if you had Matt Lodge, say, as your kind of one of your reserve front rows, you could potentially hold him if you wanted to address other areas of your team. In terms of who's going to be replacing him, uh, Thomas Flegler is going to be replacing him at the starting forward uh, prop position uh, with Reese Kennedy then moving on to the bench. So the Broncos are still running with a four forward bench. Um, obviously, other guys who had some issues coming in were Xavier Coates and Johnny Asiata. 
they obviously seem to have um you know gotten over their issues and should be good to go for round two but yeah otherwise not too much uh, in terms of uh, team ins and outs on the broncos in terms of some of the players uh david mead is obviously one i think a lot of people are going to be keeping a close eye on given that he had a good 77 point effort last week um and he's also priced in that 230k cheapy center uh range so i think a lot of guys who potentially aren't so hot on say like jason saab maybe for tour they might look to Mead as he was probably going to go have a nice initial price rise come round three uh, in terms of the forwards uh tavita pangai jr had a really solid game he had a very like you know he's very much used as like a big impact player I think he only played something in like 40 something minutes but in that time he scored 70 plus points so I think yeah one to keep an eye on I wasn't really one to go for him to begin the season because I thought he was a little bit too expensive for me um, and I guess with Matt Lodge being out potentially you could argue there's greater workload for guys like TPJ Carrigan and Ricky hopefully obviously Ricky's going to be a super popular one but they'll cover off the Titans and Broncos game so next we've got the Bulldogs and the Panthers. Uh, the Bulldogs have a few uh, ins and outs in their squad. Uh, so Jeremy Marshall King is returning to the bench, and that uh, takes out Brad Dietz uh, out of the whole se- uh, out of the seventeen. Um, and Raymond Fartella Mariner is now moved to the starting second row, uh, with Corey Waddell moving to the bench. Aside from that, no other changes to report in the uh, Bulldogs squ- uh, Bulldog squad. Bit of super coach interest here in terms of say, like I think a lot of people would have been looking at Jath- uh, Jack Hetherington, uh, Ogden, uh, Josh Jackson. I don't think there's too many kind of concerns over their minutes, say for this week, uh, given that the bench makeup is the same as last week. I would be concerned if you had guys like say Hetherington, given that he just didn't seem to show the work rate that I would have I would have been hoping for. If you're looking f- to have him as like an early season cash cow, you know he played like 58 minutes, but he only scored about like the 30. 30 something points you know it's not really a great ppm hotel and marin i was actually hoping he would just stay on the bench for longer because he did only score about 20 something points last week and i was hoping that he could continue just coming off the bench for a little bit of time hopefully his price would slide and then we could pick him up dirt cheap because he does look like someone in the bulldogs who if i was going to go anywhere in the forward in, ter- in terms of the forwards it'd probably be him he does seem to always have a knack for getting over the try line so he's something i'm definitely keeping an eye on as well uh jake avarillo unfortunately he only got that what 18 point effort something like that i think last round uh and you know coming up against the panthers who are very strong defense i don't quite know how much more points potentially has this week um probably worthwhile to know that over the weekend it is uh, expected to be raining quite a bit in the sydney area um and typically typically that does have an impact on the uh, creative attacking players given that the games are a little bit slower and the points usually just aren't as high so you know if you want to maybe take that into account plus coming up against a tough team if Avril is on your side and you're looking to move on I can't really like discourage a sell this week given that he's got that really low score in his rolling average uh, and you know you could move to guys with similar price like like Blake Ferguson for example or you could even downgrade to potentially a David Mead doesn't have to be this round but could be next round as well if you just want to create some extra money uh, to put somewhere else in your team in terms of the Panthers very very settled absolutely no changes to report here um, no real injury concerns uh, bench and starting makeup the same as what it was from last week so I think you know you know what you're going to get from the Panthers a lot of super coach, uh, super coach relevant options here you know I think if you've got guys like Brian Toto I think they're going to be a very very good player this week against the Bulldogs you know I can expect some tries down his side obviously a lot of question marks over Charlie Sands uh, given that he only scored that 18 points I wouldn't be looking to sell him this week given that they are going up against the Dogs potentially I think he's another one to wait and see uh, before maybe round three uh, where you might want to sell him but I definitely would be playing him in my starting centers this week the other kind of question mark I think is Apisai Coruscant he only scored what 28 points and only played 40 something minutes last week I'm not quite sure why I think he potentially might have picked up a knock and was just being a bit more and was being managed you know the Panthers had that game relatively comfortable but yeah so definitely some question marks over him again probably one that I would recommend maybe just to wait one more round if you can uh, but I completely understand you know wanting to sell him and downgrade him because there's so many other good hooker options like Jaden Braley you know Reed Money if you want to go for like an initial price rise given that he had that really big score last week um, and then some cheaper hookers like say if you didn't start with Jacob Little uh, or Connor Watson for example so Coruscant I think is definitely going to be one who I'll expect to see a lot of trades out for and given that his price quite high he does free up a lot of money that people will, will prioritize uh, elsewhere in their team but yeah apart from that you know Kurt Capewell you know, I don't really see how the minutes are going to differ too much for the guys like Kikau, Capewell, and Liam Martin. Uh, and Spencer Linu and Leota, two props to keep an eye on. I think I'm very happy to have Linu as one of my, just like kind of my cash cow generating front row forwards. He looked really impressive. Um, but yeah, otherwise very settled side with the Panthers. So next up, we got the Sea Eagles versus the Rabbitohs. The only real notable change to report from the Sea Eagles is that Andrew Davey, a uh, guy I kind of talked about preseason as hopefully a good mid-range second row forward cash cow. He has uh, moved to the starting role um, at the expense 
defense of Jas Kazuski, who's now moved to the bench. Davey, someone I'm definitely going to have a try and watch that game, see how he performs. Um, he did come off the bench last week and looked pretty good. I think if he has another good outing this game, uh, and we'll also see how his minutes are as well, because if someone, for example, if he played 80 minutes, I think previously last season when he played 80 minutes, he was getting scores 60 plus. Um, so if he's able to kind of sm- like knock out a score like that, if he's getting that 80 minutes, I'd be really tempted to bring him in uh, in the next round. But apart from that, like I wouldn't really go, especially against the Rabbitohs, who are a tough, tough side. You know, guys like Jason Saab, Daily Cherry Evans. I know Jason Saab only scored what, 11 points. I just don't think the game was quite there for the Sea Eagles last round. You know, they just got blown off the park. So they, they honestly didn't have that many attempts really down at the Roosters try line. I don't even, I, and to be honest, I don't know how much more that's going to happen in this game as well. I could see the Rabbitohs winning this very comfortably. So I know he's one that a lot of people might be looking to sell to say David Mead. I would maybe just hold him for another week. And, you know, he's on my bench anyway. I'm not going to be playing in my 17 and I wouldn't recommend playing him in your 17. But I don't think he's like a priority sell, given that he's so cheap already. I think there are other bigger issues in my team that I might want to be um, tackling first. In terms of the Rabbitohs, there are a few notable changes here. So the big ones are Josh Mansell and Jacob Host, both being dropped out of the 17 entirely, which is huge for Mansell owners. I know a couple of people had asked in the comments whether they wanted to hold or sell him. Look, I think after getting that really low score the previous round and then being dropped, I think he becomes a sell. I think it's just too much money in your centers to be um, just leaving on your bench, hoping that he comes back soon. So I think if I had Mansour, I would definitely be selling. I would maybe, you know, you've got a lot of options if you do have him at that price. You know, you can move down to Brian Toto. Probably would be my number one target, I think, given that Panthers early draw and he looked really impressive. Uh, and Jacob Host, I think he was kind of a popular option coming into round one given that he was named starting in the uh now he was named in the starting lineup for the Rabbitohs but if he's out of the whole 17 I think he also then becomes a bit of a sell um, and so replacing him is Keon Klomatungi into the starting lineup uh, and Patrick Margo moves now onto the bench in replacement uh, and Jackson Paulo will replace Josh Mansell's wing spot at the Rabbitohs as well what is interesting I guess is that the bench is the, is the same as what it was from last week and um, Tom Burgess was able to overcome that kind of burn issue I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe someone like Jai Arrow move into that starting lineup just prior to the game. Uh, But either way, I think Arrow looked really impressive off the bench last week. Definitely someone I'm going to be keeping an eye on this round as well. Uh, See how his minutes are, see how he performs um, before maybe thinking about bringing him into my team if he's going to, if he scores well again and looks to have a good price rise. But yeah, I think if you own guys like Latrell, Cody Walker, you know, Alex Johnston, uh, Damian Cook, I think they're all very, very good players this week. I can I can see Latrell and Cody Walker going huge this uh, this round against the Sea Eagles. Damian Cook, I guess, a bit is a bigger question mark given that he didn't really perform that well last week. Personally, and if I did have him, I think I would play him and hold him. I don't think I'd be selling him this round. I would just want to wait and see how they perform against Sea Eagles. You know, if the Rabbitohs crank out like 36 points uh, and he only, you know, scores say maybe 40 or 50 points, I think that's a sign that, you know, potentially he's not going to be as involved in the attack as we would hope. And I think then he becomes a sell because he's very, very expensive. Um, and you do have the flexibility then. You could go downgrade to like a Jaden Braley and create almost 300k elsewhere. And, you know, you could pump that into a cheapy center and turn that person into like a Brian Toto, for example. So I think definitely a hold for this week. Um, I don't, But I don't begrudge people selling if they want to be making changes quickly just to kind of attack the early rounds of trades so that they can get all the players who are going to go up in value. So... I wouldn't discourage people from selling him, but I personally would just hold him. But apart from that, nothing else to really report on for the Rabbitohs. Uh, next, we've got the Cowboys versus the Dragons. Uh, the Cowboys, very settled team, um, named 1-17 to with the same bench as well. The only real question mark in the Cowboys is really Jason Tamalolo, uh, given that he only scored 36 points, uh, playing 51 minutes last round. I think if you own Jason Tamalolo, for me, I mean, you could say yes, you can wait and see how, how he's used again. Uh, this round, but Todd Payton's come out and he looks, and he's made it very, very clear in where he stands in terms of how he's going to use Tamalolo. So for me, I can see for the foreseeable future that Tamalolo gets used in that 50-minute role, um, and that really then does reduce his um, output. I wouldn't expect 36 points from him, obviously, uh, even if he played 50 minutes, I'll probably be more expecting around the 50 mark, but even at his price, that still means he's going to go down in value quite a bit, and I think there's so many other good second or forward options. I think if I had Tamalolo, I would probably sell uh, this round, uh, given that there's probably other changes in your team that you might want to make before the price changes kick in. So I think Tamalolo then becomes a sell and at his price. You can really go down to anyone. Uh, in terms of the Dragons, pretty settled team as well. The only inclusion is Corey Norman, who moves in for Adam Clune, who's dropped out of the 17 altogether. 
Uh, Terrell Fumiano named again at lock, which is encouraging for me, given that I have him on my bench. Um, and ho- he scored 56 points last week, which I was really um, happy to see. And hopefully, if he continues in this similar role that he did last week and he's able to knock out another 40 to 50 points, I'd be looking to get him in just as a bit of an early season cash cow, given that he's only priced about 260k. But aside from that, there's not really anyone else at the Dragons I'm too interested in. Um, obviously, Andrew McCullough, he had a decent showing last week, scoring, I think, 65, 64. Um, you know what you're going to get from him. He's just going to make a bunch of tackles. He's all base. So I think price about 470k, you could potentially go with him. But apart from that, there's not really too much interest aside in the, apart from maybe those two players in the Dragons. So next up, we've got the Roosters versus the West Tigers. In terms of the Tigers, the main change is that Adam Dewey has come back into the round two side um, and he's moved back into that 5-8 role pushing Moses Mbai onto the bench, uh, and then Russell Packer drops out of that uh, bench and into the reserve. I guess the question mark over the, the Tigers uh, with Mbai moving to number 14 is the impact it has on Jacob Little and his minutes. Uh, really encouraging last week to see him play the full 80, but we did, but we, you know, we all kind of knew that with Dewey returning and by moving to 14 was the likely outcome, and then he might spell Jacob Little at times, uh, playing in that number nine role. So I think if you have Little, still a very safe hold. I don't know if I'd play him in my 17 this round, but you know, I think if you're a non-owner, this is a good round to kind of see how the minutes shape up, given that this is probably going to be how the Tigers long-term are going to be structured. And I think, you know, if he still plays maybe 60 to 70 minutes uh, and has a good score, then I think you can maybe jump on him for early cash generation. He only had about, I think, 44 points in base in his 80 minutes, which is not super encouraging. You know, you'd probably hope for more than that if he's in, if you're for a uh, hooker is playing 80 minutes but it was good to see he got the try which, which you know which bumped up his score but yeah I think he'll purely, purely just be a bit of a cash cow option for us to begin the season uh, in terms of that bench given that Russell Packer has come out they've got Otomano and McKaylee who are two middles and I think that does spell some good news for the for- rest of the forwards in the Tigers um, obviously, them two themselves might get a little bit more minutes, which is good for guys like Ojikamanu, who I think a lot of people have as a cheap front row option. Uh, Twal, Leilua, Offengawi, they might then all benefit with increased minutes. So I think, you know, Offengawi had a good showing last round. Um, and, you know, with that bench ha- losing another middle, uh, I think he potentially might go up in minutes and hopefully go up in points as well. So I think he does become a good good consideration at that kind of mid-price uh, second row or front row option that you can put into your team. Uh, moving on to the Roosters, so there's a bit of change here with the Roosters lineup. Um, obviously, biggest one, biggest one is Angus Crichton um, has got that suspension for one round uh, for that crusher tackle, um, so he'll be out for this round. But I would, uh, but he'll be back in round three. Personally, I don't think it's, he's a sell at all. Uh, you know, it's he's a he's an absolute gun, and I think if you have to trade him out this round, you're going to be wanting to bring him back almost straight away. That's two trades are already using just on the one player in the matter of like a week. And I think it's not worth it. I think if you've hopefully built your side to have a bit of, you know, bench cover, I think just it just means just playing them instead of Quiet and just copying the points hit for the week. I wouldn't be looking to sell him at all. Uh, Jake Friend is another out given that concussion. Don't quite know actually yet what his return date is going to be. Obviously, the Roosters are very conservative with the players in terms of, you know, when they get head knocks and concussions. So I don't know if he'd be come back into the side straight away next week, but kind of want to keep an eye on and see. Um, and Adam Kieran, he had that dislocated wrist issue, and I think he's expected to be out for four to six weeks. So the guys who replace him will be Fletcher Baker moves into the bench, uh, with Nat Butcher moving to the starting lineup for the Roosters. Uh, Freddie Lussick comes in at number nine. Uh, and Drew Hutchinson comes in at number 14 to kind of fill in uh, for uh, Adam Kieran. Just looking at that bench, I'm not quite sure how what it means for guys like, say, Lachlan Lamb. I don't know if Freddie Lussick will play the full 80 minutes. Potentially what might happen, in my opinion, is, you know, if Lussick goes off for a spell, Lamb might then go into number nine. Um, and Drew Hutchinson, who can play in the halves, uh, could then go into the 5-8 um, role. Or even, and then him and Kiri could just switch. Uh, but apparently Hutchinson can also play in the second row forward, so he might just be used maybe as a middle forward as, or an edge player as well. Apart from that, very settled side for the Roosters. I don't quite know what I'm going to do with Lachlan Lamb this round. I think for me, he's going to be a bit of a hold, given that they are versing the Tigers, which is a favourable matchup for them. I completely understand why people might want to be selling. There are a lot of good hooker and 5'8 options around his price as well. Um, I think what I'm thinking about doing is maybe just giving it one more round to kind of see how he perform- performs this week. If he doesn't, if you know, if the Roosters, I don't expect them, the Roosters to blow out the Tigers as they did to the Sea Eagles, but you know, if the Roosters have a good showing and he again doesn't really look too involved in the attack, I think he then becomes a sell for me because I think he'll have he'll cop a massive price drop in the following round. But aside from that, you know, obviously Tedesco I think is a very very safe captain option this round, given that you know he's got that 
he's coming off that massive game against Sea Eagles and they're versing the Tigers, which is a decent game. Uh, in terms of the forwards, uh, Takeaho, he only had that 43 minutes last round um, and his points were boosted by that try assist he got towards the end of the game. You know, there is a bit of concern in that in those easier games, they do typically rest the, their forwards um, and give them a bit of a give them a bit of a longer extended break. But you know, the goal kicking option at the Roosters, I don't think were too good. You know, T- Teddy didn't look that good with his goal kicking, so hopefully that means that Takeo does spend a bit longer on the field, given that he is going to be the primary goal kicker. Um, and Lindsay Collins, really interesting. I think he potentially might be one who's set for bigger minutes throughout the rest of the season. Uh, so I think he could be a decent one to look at in terms of a mid-range front row forward or cash cow option. So the final game of the round is the Sharks versus the Raiders. Um, not much to report uh, for either team here. Uh, the biggest one for the Sharks is Jesse Ramian getting that suspension. So he'll be out for the next three games. Um, and that means Moani Hiratori uh, moves into his center lineup. But with the Sharks, I don't see how there's too much super coach uh, relevance from them. I think the main ones will be Matt Moylan, um, who had a pretty decent game last round uh, against the um, Dragons. I'm not an owner of him, but someone I'm also wanting to see how he performs uh, this round. He could potentially be a Lock and Lamb downgrade, although I do feel that trade is a little bit sideways, but you know it does create some money. And you know if Moylan has another good game against the Raiders, his uh, value should go up. The only thing though is that he scored 53 and it was against the Dragons, who are one of probably the easiest teams uh, to play against, I think, this season. Whereas the Raiders, who I think are going to be a top four side. So we'll see how he goes against a tough team, because I think the Sharks do have an easy game against the Cowboys following. But I think the next few games after that are a bit tough. So I don't know how he's going to perform overall. Um, if you've got him in your side, obviously you hold him. I wouldn't maybe play him in your 17. But apart from that, I think not too much to report on for the Sharks. Uh, and finally, with the Raiders, very settled, uh, named 1-17 to from last round. Sebastian Chris uh, stays in the center. I think Jared Croker, I think from all reports that I've read, he seems almost ready to go, but I think that's they just want to improve his conditioning. Um, and with the forwards, you know, it's encouraging, I think, for any Ryan James owners to see that he's still named on the bench. Um, and I think obviously he scored that try last week, which really boosted his points up to that 69 points. I don't, I don't own him myself. I think I'm going to give it another week to see how the minutes shape up uh, for Ryan James before maybe looking to bring him into my front row or second row forward bench. Um, there's a lot of back row interest, I think, in the Raiders though with like Tarpany, Hudson Young. Tarpany especially played like, what, 43 minutes and he scored like 100 points. He obviously did have some attacking stats in there, but you know, with that PPM is unbelievable. Uh, the only question with him, I think, is is the minutes, really. Like, playing only 43 minutes, he's not going to get those attacking stats every round. So whether or not he's going to be scoring 143 minutes again, I, don't, I wouldn't expect so. Um, obviously, another concern would be someone like, say, Josh Hodgson. So he, he played the full 80 minutes, which was a good sign, but he only scored 30-something points. So I think if you're a Josh Hodgson owner, I would still hold and play him this round and see how he performs. But, you know, if he doesn't do too well, I would probably look to sell to someone like, say, Jaden Braley, who's very similar priced, because um, Jaden Braley, I'd expect to go up in value. Uh, and Josh Papali'i, um, obviously, I kind of failed to mention in my roundup video that he had that sin bin right at the end of the game, because uh, he only scored 33, but obviously that sin bin took off a lot of points. But even with that, he only would have scored in the 40s. And, you know, from Papali'i, when you're paying that much for him, you want to be seeing 60 plus points minimum. So maybe someone I'd keep an eye on as well like I wouldn't immediately just tra- rage trade him out you know he's got the you know in this game he could very easily probably score a try but yeah someone to kind of keep an eye on Hudson Young as well looked really really impressive uh, and he's definitely someone I'm keeping an eye on I think if I were to go into that Raiders um, forwards um, in say the starting lineup I think Hudson Young would be the one that I might be targeting and yeah in terms of the bench um, good news for Hodgson I guess that there's no Tom Starling still so he's probably set to play another 80 minutes um, and yeah, Ryan James, who I've already touched on. All right, guys, that's the team list for round two. Obviously not as kind of exciting as round one. Of Round one is obviously going to be the biggest team list Tuesday of the year. Uh, but, you know, not too many surprises. I think a few teams had some injuries and uh, some suspensions. But yeah, a lot of question marks and trade dilemmas, I think, that a lot of people are going to be going through. Definitely one that I'm, you know, a lot of trade scenarios that I'm running through my head as well. But yeah, if you guys did like this video, would really appreciate a thumbs up. Um, and do please consider subscribing as I'll be going through the team list and other content uh, throughout the rest of the 2021 Supercoach season. But until then, I'll see you guys in the next video.